We're gonna make it look fly with some DIY. We're gonna make it look fly with some DIY. We're gonna make it look fly with some DIY. Uh oh, thrift diving. Hey, what's up? It's Serena Pia from thriftdiving.com, which is a do-it-yourself blog, YouTube channel, and podcast that helps you decorate, improve, and maintain your home with paint, power tools, and thrift stores without sacrificing your budget, the environment, or style. Welcome to episode 107 of the Thrift Diving Podcast. And today, I'm actually doing a really fun interview with someone who is the head of the organization. He's the president and CEO of Habitat for Humanity. You've heard me speak about this organization so many times. In fact, we just did a 30-day DIY money makeover challenge, and we donated $170 to Habitat, my local Habitat, where I'm actually a volunteer for the past four years. So in this episode, we're going to learn some things about Habitat, things that you may not have already have known. This organization is near and dear to my heart because it aligns so well with what I believe here at Thrift Ivy and what I think you believe, right? That everybody should deserve to, or have the opportunity, I should say, to buy a home and be able to afford a home and build generational wealth. And You'll see in just a moment that this organization is doing amazing things. Now, if you've never considered volunteering for Habitat, I want you to think about not only the work that you can do and the the help that you can provide to this organization, because they literally rely on volunteers, but I also want you to think about what you can learn as a Habitat volunteer. You know, this is how I got a lot of hands-on experience, things that I didn't even know how to do. Even though I went to school for carpentry, every time I go to volunteer with Habitat, there's always something else I learn how to do. (laughs) I've learned how to do, I mean, I've done framing in my carpentry program, but I've done framing. I have learned how to put up a fence. And because of what I learned at Habitat, I now feel comfortable, hopefully crossing my fingers this spring, to be able to put a fence up in my backyard. That's probably going to span about 40 feet. (laughs) And that's because I was able to get my hands dirty as a volunteer, as a crew leader with Habitat. So as you're listening to this conversation today with Jeff D, who's the president and CEO of Habitat, I want you to, to keep an open mind and think about how you might be able to volunteer and give back, but also how this organization could help you to grow your DIY skills so that the projects that you're doing around your home, around your yard, this is a great opportunity for you to learn, get your hands dirty, and know that you're doing something great for your community. So I'm going to go ahead and stop talking, but I will say real quick, the interview, his microphone sounds really good. My microphone It's not a bad microphone, but I'm still recording here in my she shed and there's so much reverberation (laughs) around me. The echo is is pretty audible. And I think for me to go in and try to edit that out, it was going to take a lot of time and effort to do that. So I apologize. Right now I'm actually recording with with two pillows smack up next to my microphone. (laughs) So I'm literally speaking into pillows at this point. But because there's so much uh, echo, there's not a lot of things here in my she shed yet to absorb that sound, it sounds pretty bad. So I do need to maybe make that a DIY project and build a little enclosed thing where I could absorb some of that uh, echo. But I apologize for that. So if you can get through that echo, it's a great conversation. And I don't want to spoil anything for you. But I will tell you that Jeff and I, we talk about what it's like to actually be become a homeowner through Habitat and what some of those requirements are. In fact, you may be someone who's eligible for a Habitat home. You might be listening to this and not even realize in your area, you actually could apply to get, I don't say get, to buy a home from Habitat because they don't actually give you homes. You have to buy the home. But you'll hear all of that in our conversation in just a moment. Again, I'm speaking with Jeff D. He's the president and CEO of the Habitat for Humanity Metro. It's the local affiliate chapter here in the D.C., Maryland area. And I can't wait for you to hear this conversation. So sit back, relax, and let's jump into the conversation right now with Jeff D. I'm so excited to talk to you because I am always touting how wonderful Habitat for Humanity is. Oh, great. And 
you know, I thought, you know, why not actually get the person who knows the most about Habitat for Humanity and all the great things that you're doing in the community and what it's like for volunteers, how you look for volunteers, how this organization is continuing to run. And really, it's more of a conversation because I want to hear from you just some of the things that maybe people don't know about the Habitat for Humanity. Habitat is an amazing organization. I've been with them probably four years as a crew leader. I think two, I think 2023 is going on four years. I'm committed to its mission. I love volunteering. So I thought this is a great opportunity to get together with you and just hear more about Habitat and the things that you're doing. In your own words, tell me a little bit about what you do for Habitat for Humanity Metro. Jeff D., I'm the president and CEO of Habitat for Humanity Metro Maryland. We serve Montgomery and Prince George's County in Maryland. And our whole goal is home ownership opportunities, whether it's home construction or home preservation. But we're, you know, uh, we're always focused on home ownership because that really is, you know, home ownership is the number one way that most people build wealth in this country. Um, And it also provides an opportunity for people to have a safe and decent place to live. So I know that Habitat, I think it started 1976. Am I correct? Yep. Okay. Yep. So how was it funded? What was the vision that whoever created, I don't, I don't know the foundation or, you know, the backstory of Habitat for Humanity, but you know, what kind of crisis was happening at the time where someone said, Hey, we need this program for people who maybe they can't afford home ownership. We need to make this affordable. What was that vision like, or, or what was the problem that led to the vision? So in the 1930s and 40s, in rural Georgia, in a place called Koinonia Farm, there was a gentleman, Clarence Jordan, who was a Greek biblical scholar. And what he tried to do was recreate first century Christianity in Koinonia Farm, where whites and blacks lived together, they worked together, and they ate together, and they held everything in common. So this Koinonia farm, which still exists today, was an attempt to bring Christian principles into action or put Christian principles into action. So uh, as you can imagine, this was not looked upon favorably by some in rural Georgia in the 40s, 30s and 40s. So they faced a lot of headwinds, bombings, death threats, et cetera, like that. But they persevered. They persevered. And it was a farm, so they raised different products and sold and sold it to the community, et cetera. So I think it was in the 50s or could be the 60s. The Poinonia Farm, Clarence Jordan, started looking beyond this concept of of just creating a place for first century Christianity to be recreated. And started looking at other things. And one of the things that was noticed was the lack of decent and affordable housing in the area. And that's where the idea, you know, Habitat for Humanity came out of uh, the South and focused on poverty housing because the people that were in that surrounding area lived like literally lived in shacks, uh, Mm -hmm. running water and stuff like that. So Clarence Jewell, it's called partnership housing. So this this idea of partnership housing came out of Koinonia Farm. And the idea is much like there's a, there, were, there was a movie probably 20 years ago now, Pay It Forward. Mm-hmm. And the best way to illustrate this partnership housing concept is people came together and they raised money and they built a house with the family. And, and it's important to emphasize the preposition with, and then they sold it to the family. And then the family began to make a mortgage payment. Mm -hmm. That mortgage payment was then taken and more money was raised. And then they built the next house and the next house, the next, you know, so it's that pay it forward concept. And it was based on biblical or, or it is still based on biblical economics, no profit, no interest loans. So they kind of had this concept in the partnership housing concept also relied on the fund for humanity. It's called the fund for humanity, which is that same concept that we take money that's raised and we put it towards a house. And then we take that money in the mortgage and put it towards the next house, et cetera, like that. So at the same time, this was going on. There was a couple Millard and Linda Fuller who lived in Georgia, Alabama in the South. 
Mm-hmm. And the, the long and short of it is that they were millionaires in the 60s. He was very good at what he did. He, he did a lot of direct mail work. And they had everything that society tells them would make them happy, but yet their marriage was falling apart. So essentially, his wife gave him an ultimatum and said, you can come with me to New York. I don't, she was going to New York for something. I don't know what it was, but she can come with me to New York or you can stay here with all the material stuff. And he went with her to New York, I think, you know, to work on their marriage. And then they fought, I don't know how, but somehow they found their way down to Georgia and to Koinonia Farm, mm. where they encountered Clarence Jordan and this concept of partnership housing. And the story goes, as I understand it, they were going to just spend the afternoon there and they ended up spending months and years there, right? It was wow. just, oh, we're just going to be here for a couple hours. And then, you know, it changed everything. So they went to Africa to perf- sort of put this partnership housing into action for three years, came back, and then they launched Habitat for Humanity mm-hmm. in one of the buildings at Quinonia Farm, moved to America's Georgia, where we're, we're headquartered today and then it it just spread out from there our affiliate was started in 1982 in montgomery county by Mm -hmm. a group of concerned citizens who saw the need for decent affordable housing in montgomery county and since 1982 we've we have built a rehab to 100 and we're on our 103rd home i think okay so we have you know we're building homes decent affordable homes But what about the current housing stock? So people who own their own homes, but don't have the financial wherewithal to upkeep, et cetera, like that. So early 2000s, I think they called it a brush with kindness. Basically, it was a repair weatherization program. And we start, we formally, Habitat Metro Maryland formally started ours in 2010. And we now operate a really robust repair weatherization program. We do about 115 projects a year. We'll spend, I don't know, we spend, I think it's 25,000 per project, or we can spend up to 25,000 per project, most of which is not repaid because it's grant money. Mm -hmm. And with the repair weatherization, which comes under the umbrella of home preservation, so home Mm -hmm. construction and home preservation. So that is open to anybody from 0%, they make no money, all the way up to 80% AMI. Our area median income in the DC metropolitan area, this I think is $146,000, which is ridiculous. I don't exactly know the numbers that that works out to, but typically our repair and weatherization or our home preservation program focuses on people on the lower end of the spectrum, mm-hmm. uh, the AMI spectrum. Not that we wouldn't be open to someone at 70%, but it just it tends to be people who are older, living on fixed incomes, living by themselves. Typically, there's someone in their in their household with a disability. Now, it doesn't have to be older because we have worked on houses, you know, for people in their 30s and 40s. But that's typically the right. case. Uh, we do a lot of accessibility improvements to their house. Do a lot of HVAC repairs, roof can, can repairs. I- can oh, I sorry. Also add something you had mentioned about the ADA, the American Disability Act. I know there was a few homes that I'd worked on, and I thought this was amazing that when Habitat builds their homes, you build it as it's going to be a forever home. So you build it with the understanding that this person, okay, maybe they're not going to live here forever, but if they do live in this home forever, we're going to make sure that we construct this home so that if they need to get a wheelchair into the bathroom, you know, we're not going to build the bathroom so that you've got to step up into the tub or shower. This is a home that hopefully this will be your forever home. And so designing it with those features in mind that this person is going to have this home for the rest of their life. And I really thought that was pretty great because, you know, when people have the opportunity to get into this home, why would they want to leave? Why would they want to sell? This is a great home that they've gotten so that they can mature into this home. I mean, sometimes I look at my home and I'm like, wow, I don't really know how I'm going to age in this home if I have bad knees or if I need to get into the shower, like how, how's that going to happen? So I like that you build that into your home. And so for the, the people that have already moved into the home. So I know right now you said this is home 103. I think it's 103. Yeah. Do you have any information on like the people, you know, those early people or maybe like home number 50 or what happens to those people? They move into the home and then do you follow up with them? Like 
follow up with them? Like what's, what's that? Well, actually let's, let me take it back because now I'm asking a different question. Walk me through what it's like for a person to become a Habitat for Humanity homeowner. And, and then the second part of that is, can you tell me some of the stories of the people, you know, who are homeowner number 50 or 60? What are, what are their stories like now? And were you successful in helping them to build the wealth, which I'm assuming that you have because they, I'm asking you a lot of things here. <laughs> So let's let's walk back to what are the qualifications? Who are these people who are getting this option of a Habitat home? And, and what does that look like for them? Before that, let me just answer or, or piggyback onto your other point. Mm-hmm. So as you mentioned, we call them universal design homes. Mm-hmm. Uh, we own the, the plans for the universal design homes. And as you mentioned, you're right. The, the idea of a universal design home is it allows people to age in place and it's open to anybody. So it's just as easy to push a baby stroller across the mm. across the door as it is to push a wheelchair or a like a walker walker. Right. Mm-hmm. And the idea is, as you as you mentioned, our goal is for. I mean, look, we're all about economic empowerment. Right. Most people stay in their habitat homes. I, you know, you're not going to get better than a 0% interest rate, but we do have from time to time that people improve their economic circumstances or things change and they sell the home. I'll write a note to make sure I talk about that. They sell the home and they move somewhere else and God bless them. That's what we want because they've improved their economic circumstances. We had one family, we built a 19 pound home community in, in um, Gaithersburg called Maple Hill. Gentleman and his family, they bought the town home in 2014. He used the savings between the rent and the mortgage to go back to school, get an education, maybe an advanced degree. I'm not sure. He got a better paying job. Family grew and they needed a bigger house. So he sold the house back to Habitat and then he purchased another house. So that was an example of where that opportunity to have stable housing with a with no interest rate, low mortgage, enabled him to save more, invest in himself and his family, and then move to a different house. So that's I mean that's awesome. that's awesome. That's what you want. Right? That's what you want. Exactly. Building that wealth and that equity. Yeah. Yeah. Right. All right. So let's just go back to to your question. One of the questions, which was, how does this all work? So Serena, let me ask you a question. Which houses do you do you remember which houses you worked on? Oh, I don't remember the streets. Mm. Was it, gosh, now I can't remember, Opus? <laughs> yes, I have worked on that one, yes. So with Crystal and her two kids, one of whom is permanently disabled? Oh, I didn't know that. I don't think I actually got to attend the ribbon cutting. And that's that's what I really want to be a part of. Because, you know, a lot of times, like, I'll kind of pop in when I'm available. Maybe I'll do one or two visits as a crew leader for that. Group. Right. And then... I kind of fall off because my schedule may get busy, <laughs> but then, you know, I always want to kind of see it through to the end because it's amazing when you see, especially there was one home that we worked on, which was, it, it really looked like it should have been completely torn down. I don't remember exactly where it was, but it was in pretty bad condition, but I, I think they were able to preserve the structure and completely redo it. It's probably done by now. I'd have to look up the address. Um, But those are the homes that I'm like, I don't know how you're going to save this home. (laughs) And it was just amazing. It was, was it, was it Virginia Ave? I think so. I don't think it was Virginia Avenue. I'd have to, ah, it's, it's been a couple of years. It's been a couple of years. To kind of get to your, your point. And then I'm going to use Opus as an example. Mm -hmm. So under home construction, There's new construction, which is our universal design homes. Mm -hmm. And then there's rehabs uh, where we take a vacant distressed property. We totally gut it, like literally down to the studs and then rebuild it. So when you, you know, you talk about, oh, there was a house that really should have been torn down. That's most of our houses Mm -hmm. because our challenge in this area is that we're competing against investors, right? I I got no issue with someone making a profit. But when we look at a house, we look at it as how much money do we need to put into this house to make sure that it is going to be safe, comfortable, affordable, energy efficient Mm -hmm. for the next 30 years? 
An investor has a different mentality, right? An investor is going to come in and say, okay, what's the least amount of money I can put it in this to make it look good so I can flip it. Right. So we as Habitat, we we go for the houses that are in the worst shape. Mm-hmm. One, because those are more likely the ones we can afford. Not well, I mean, that's actually really that's that's primarily it's those are the ones we can afford because most investors aren't going to touch it. We will go in and like I said, we will we will gut the house, whatever house it was that you saw, that that's a typical experience. And as you can attest to, no, oh, like yes. we, you got it. We just got the house. Yeah, there was like concrete. Um, I know there was. John, like one of the construction managers, I remember him telling me like, yeah, we spent all day yesterday completely ripping out whatever piping was in that concrete. So they had to get into the concrete. <laughs> I was like, whoa, this is a big job. But oh, yeah, that I think that's Garland in Tacoma Garland, Park. That, I think that yeah. might be it. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's Garland in Tacoma Park. That's a yes. that's a cool story that I don't want to use up all your time, but I can tell you some. Oh, no, I have as it. much time as you have. OK, so. So we will gut the house and we will put in anywhere from 100 to 150,000 into the home. We will bring it to be code compliant. We will energy efficient. We will, you know, spray foam insulation. So the house is sealed. It's energy efficient. We will Mm -hmm. put all new items, all new appliances and stuff in. Not high grade, but we will put in appliances that we know are going to last and do good we'll look at a roof and we'll be like, okay, that roof has 10 more years in it. So an investor might be like, well, I ain't touching it. We will say, okay, let's put a new roof on because the families we serve are lower income families. And so someone who's making 50% AMI, you know, they may not have the financial elasticity, if that's the right word, or depth. So that if the roof goes in 10 years, all of a sudden you got to come up with a $15,000 $15,000 chunk of money to fix the roof. So we will do the most we can to set up the family for success. The fruit of that right. is the fact that we have had one foreclosure in 40 years. Right? Wow. One foreclosure. That and nationally, yeah, nationally, the foreclosure rate for Habitat houses is about 2%. So hmm. far down, far below other programs, stuff yeah. like that. That's so yeah. So when you ask, all right, how how do you how do you find the families? So we do a lot of advertising and networking. So when we have a home availability, like Garland as an example, we have an inquiry list. So if you were to come to me and say, Hey Jeff, I would like to work with Habitat, we say, Okay, we don't have a house right now, but when we do, get your name on the inquiry inquiry list. I don't know why that's so hard for me to say. <laughs> And we will send out an email blast. It's a one pager. It will tell you where the house is located. It will tell you, you know, it, it is, you know, two bedroom, one bed, whatever it is, all the all the uh, elements of it. And mm-hmm. then the application period will open. So a family who's interested in housing and interested in working with us, they have to fill out an application just like you or I did to buy a house. So they have to provide all the proof of income, et cetera, like that. Because Habitat, if you think back to Koinonia Farm, that fund for humanity, all right, we are the bank. So Habitat for Humanity is mm-hmm. the bank. We are issuing a mortgage to the family. So we have to underwrite it to strict standards, just like a bank would. The difference is we don't necessarily look at the credit score, right? I mean, we do have a minimum. I think the minimum credit score is 580. But, you know, if someone is 580 and they have some other challenges on their credit score, like medical bills or whatever, then we might be more willing to overlook those. And we look at the whole whole picture. Right. So they like will... there's, a, there's some forgiveness in there because you understand that, you know, there's some debt that you just couldn't help if you've got medical bills on there. And it's, yeah. it's something that's. I mean, it's a problem for everyone, whether you're low income, whether you're middle income, people are going to have some some health debt on there that should not wreck your chances of building wealth for sure. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so, I mean, yeah, we, there's there's that understanding, right? There's the objective criteria, but then there's also the understanding. So like, let's say someone has a, a 580 for a credit score, but they have no debt, you know, so their debt to income ratio is like really low. Well, mm-hmm. to us that that debt to income ratio is actually probably more important than necessarily the credit score. Right. 
right? It's not a black and white that we look at as opposed to a bank, nothing against a bank. So families apply for partnership. There are three criteria that we use. One is they have to have a legitimate need for housing. In our area, Montgomery, Prince George's County, typically we are dealing with, we don't really have poverty housing in our service area. That's what we call our area. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it, it does exist in a couple of, but not really. Not like if you go to Western Maryland or Western Virginia or mm -hmm. some other place, right? You're not, you don't really have the poverty housing. What we encounter is illegal basements, high cost burden. So if someone is paying more than 30% of their income on housing, most people are paying 50%, lower income families are paying 50%. That's a legitimate need for housing. And I use the word legitimate intentionally because I used to be at Loudoun Habitat for Humanity in Loudoun County, Virginia. Mm -hmm. Someone called up one time and said, we want a house. Okay. We already have a house. We need a bigger house or we want a bigger house. And it wasn't, we want a bigger house because we're overcrowded. It's we want a bigger house. Well, they don't There's understand the Habitat. So for us, that's not a legitimate need for housing. Right. You know? I mean, so legitimate to me would be you've got a mother and three kids or four kids in a one bedroom basement area. Yep. I mean, that to me is, that's pretty substantial to me. Yep. Or you got three families living in a house, which happens, or three families living in an apartment, sharing mm -hmm. an apartment, one bathroom, you know, mm -hmm. or there's a family living in an apartment they're paying 50% of their rent. And then the carpeting in the apartment hasn't been changed out. And the children have asthma directly related to the carpet, right? Wow. Or there's mold, you know, so th that's that's more an example of what we consider legitimate. Mm -hmm. um, and do those people get pushed up on the list based on some of those factors? I wouldn't say or they get pushed on the list, I mean, it, it just kind of helps us clarify. Let me keep going and, and I'll be able to answer your question when I go through it. So there's legitimate housing need. There's ability to pay. So there is a mortgage. So they have to have income. Now, they can have income from a job. They can have income from a social security disability. They can have income from alimony. They just have to have income that they can prove to us that they get, that they receive, you know, they could use to 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 pay the mortgage. So they have to have a job or they have to have income coming in to mm -hmm. their household. And then the last criteria is what we call a willingness to partner. So as you know, one of the ways that we are able to make this model work is we, the use of volunteers. So just like when you come out and volunteer. Yes. So the partner families contribute what we call sweat equity. Okay. So they have to be I out on the this. field. Yeah. I love yeah. the sweat equity. <laughs> yeah, they have to be out on the build site. Let's say the family has to do 400 hours of sweat equity towards the house. Mm -hmm. 200 of that is on the build site. Mind you, that they're doing that while they're still working, right? Mm. One, one story I remember is a husband and wife. The wife worked by taking care of the children. That's mm -hmm. a job in and of oh, itself, yes. right? So she worked at home raising the children and the father work two jobs. So basically he would work from you know noon to the next morning, mm -hmm. go to the build site, work all day on his house, then go home and sleep. And then the next, you know what I'm saying? So, mm -hmm. so they're you doing that. I love, you know what I love about that model? As a DIYer, you know, I work on my home. Anyone who's listening to this, we work on our homes or some people may be listening to this who are gearing up to work on their homes. Right or do projects and get that motivation to do it. But when you put that time and effort into your own home, there is a sense of pride that comes with that. And I think yep. that's, that's, I mean, in my opinion, I think that's the reason why you've only had one default on a loan in 40 years is because you require these people to be a part of it. Imagine if somebody just gives you a home, you know, at the end of a year of, of let's say people volunteering to pull, pull this home together and they just turn over the keys here, you know, here, Miss Crystal, that home is not going to be appreciated compared to, look, I helped put these floors in. You better take care of this because I know what work it, it requires to do all of this. I had to take care of this and I want to maintain this. Was that a feature of Habitat from the very beginning? Or yeah. Yeah. Really? Okay. That's yeah. Very, very, very beginning. 
it's not biblical, but the biblical economics, but also the, the, the fact that people have to contribute to the house because yeah. it was, it was the community coming together. You said the word, you know, giving. So whenever I hate it, when I see a, a press release or something in the media, like Habitat gave a family that we don't give anything. No. That's why I was saying earlier, we say with a family, not yes. for a family, yes. but you bring up a really good point. Matter of fact, one of our families that we're working with right now, she's going to buy a property in, on Fisk Ave in Glen Arden. Oh, I think she I've was, worked. Yeah, I think I've worked on that property. Yeah. Carolyn, she said, look, now that I've worked on my house, one, I know how to fix things if something happens. And two, if I can't fix the HVAC unit, I know enough. So if someone's trying to pull one over my Yes. Pull wool over my eyes, right? So it gives them the opportunity to gain confidence that they can fix it, or I know who to ask. And and sometimes they'll come back to us, you know. I, so once we sell the house to the family, it's theirs. It's home ownership. It's their home. We offer a year warranty. But in four years, if they say, "Hey, this is happening," we'll say, "Hey, all right, you need to go talk to this person," or "Here's what you do." So. Uh, so it's legitimate housing need, willingness to ability to pay, willingness to partner. Now, this comes up when people say, well, well what if someone can't do it? So there's a difference between can't and won't. Can't, can't do it. You know, if you are, Serena, if you are a, a disabled veteran or disabled and you can't do the work, that's different. Most of the time, what will happen is they will they'll be asked to do something else. So they come into the office or they go to do something in the local community. So they're contributing just in a different way. Mm -hmm. Or the other, they volunteer at the restores. Yeah, or they volunteer, they volunteer at the restores. Volunteer at the restores. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, which is a great DIY place. Oh, yeah. Uh, so, we love the restore. <laughs> yeah. We weren't paid for that, but we do. So the other element of willingness to partner, and this goes to your point you made earlier, is of the 400 hours, 200 have to be on the construction site, 200, I'm just using numbers, would have to be in home education courses. So yes. what does it mean to budget? What is homeowner's okay. insurance? Why is homeowner's insurance important? When you go to sign those documents to buy the house, what are you actually signing? Most people mm -hmm. probably don't know what they're signing, but our families go through every single line. They know exactly what they're signing, what's involved. Um, there's Part of it, we call it, where they are given, you know, we have this, not a binder packet, like here's what you need to do, home maintenance, right? Yeah. You know, you need to clean your gutters once a year, right? You need to do this, you know. Um, I feel know. like there should be, I feel like there should be that course for everybody who buys a home. Yeah. I really do, because I mean, for people, or let's say not a required thing, but an option. Like, in fact, I'll tell you, you know, that's one of the things that really stressed me out when I bought my home. You know, you may not know my backstory, so I'll tell you very, very. Yeah, I, actually, I don't. I'd love to hear it. Yeah. So back uh, 2010, my husband and I, we were in a two bedroom condo. And at that point, we had two kids. We wanted to expand. And I said, well, let's go look for a single family home. So we found one just a few miles away. Well, it's a 1973. So when I say that it was the ugliest home on the block, the other homes probably were ugly too, but it had wallpaper. It had all kinds of things that needed to be done. And I started blogging about, okay, well, I'm fixing up this home. I don't know how to do these things, but I'm going to document it. We don't have any furniture. And Jeff, I literally had forgotten that just because we could afford the mortgage or what I think we could afford, I totally forgot we needed to decorate the house. Like all those yeah. other things that yeah. you think about when you have a house, I literally didn't think about those until we were moved in. But I've always loved thrift stores, but that's when I started going to thrift stores, finding the furniture that we need. Like literally 95% of everything in my house has come from a thrift store because oh, wow. like, yeah, I'm not, I'm not going to pay or get myself into credit card debt by trying to furnish this house. And then I found that I love doing it. I put it online as a blog, as a YouTube channel, and that's how people find me. And over the years, it's really morphed into, okay, now that we know how to refinish furniture and maybe put a room together so it looks nice and comfortable without going into debt, how do we use power tools? How do we do some of these things? Like, when do we clean the gutters? How do we reseed the lawn? How do we do these things that would cost thousands and thousands of dollars to have professionals come in to do? 
And even if we don't do all of it ourselves, you spoke to something that that really kind of gave me goosebumps because the homeowner who said, even if I don't know how to do it, now I know kind of what the language is and whether my chain is being yanked here. Yeah. <laughs> when we first moved in, the home had a kind of a musty smell and I didn't realize it until after we had signed all the papers and kind of walked through as is wouldn't have done, I wouldn't do that now, but there was a man who had come to the home and I thought that I had a solution for the basement and he had this thousand dollar solution. And you have to make, you have to make a decision now because I'm calling my manager and you want that deal. Now you have to decide now. And I remember looking at my husband and I'm like, well, maybe this, all we needed was a dehumidifier, (laughs) but you know, that was probably $200. So he sold us this thousand dollar thing that he attached in the basement and I just remember for the first couple of months or the first few months of home ownership, walking around with this feeling of anxiety, like, oh my gosh, what did we get ourselves into? I don't know what to do. And your homeowners that are buying these habitat homes that you've created with them, they're not going to feel that because you're giving them the education, you're giving them the confidence. You know, while they're there building, they can ask the construction managers, the crew leaders, any question that they want and get an answer. So when they're moving into their homes, they're confident. They're like, I got this. And even if I don't, I know who to call. I know what, you know, what is real and what's not real. And someone's not going to pull the wool over my eyes. And I think that's why I, why I love Habitat's mission, because you don't just, you know, throw people to the wolves after they sign the paperwork. No, there's a whole right. bunch of other things that they're doing. And I think our mission is aligned because I feel that same sense of responsibility that I want people to walk into their home, whether they're buying a home or whether they've already been in their home to say, wow, you know what, because I have listened to Serena or maybe because I had volunteered with Habitat, I feel more comfortable that I know kind of what's going on in my house. I understand the systems a little, the language, and I, I'm not going to be taken for a ride by somebody that comes in and tries to tell me something. So that's why I I volunteer because I'm so supportive of your mission and how you nurture. That's the word you nurture homeowners because this is how we build wealth. Without a home, you know, most of us we don't build up that wealth, that equity that we can then roll into another home or when we pass away, you know, the next generation, that's generational wealth. And you're right. helping to build generational wealth. And to me, that's so important because if we didn't have our home, we probably wouldn't have something to pass on to our kids. If we hadn't purchased, we wouldn't have that generational wealth. So sorry to lay all that on you, but <laughs> I just no, I mean, no. I know. I mean, how much I, I want to, I want to, I want to be like, amen, hallelujah. I mean, that's, (laughs) uh, no, but seriously, I mean, that's, uh, yeah. uh, And I'll I'll share one other thing with you too. You know, I thought that maybe there would be kind of a natural alignment between thrift diving and Habitat for Humanity because, you know, I started thinking about once the people move into the house, like, yes, they know how to do things around their home, but I started thinking about it from the aspect of now they have this beautiful home how are they going to decorate it? You know, Mm -hmm. do they have the kind of things that they want to bring into their home? You know, they've had these courses and now they know, okay, don't go into credit card debt, but do they have the understanding that they could take something that's old? Maybe they have an old table from their basement apartment. And instead of having to get a new table, do they, do they know how to paint this table to strip this table so that they can really create this home? And I feel like I, I feel like I come on the back end of Habitat, you know, like once people actually get in, okay, give them to me. Let me tell them how to paint furniture and and find things at the thrift store, at the restores. (laughs) And so we've never been able to collaborate in that kind of way, but I just feel there's just this natural flow from Habitat to, you know, what I do with my audience. And so who knows, maybe in the future we can coordinate something, but yeah. So so for your homeowners that move into these homes, do you have any other stories of homeowners who, you know, are several years in that you have personal knowledge where you can share something about their story? Maybe something that may have stuck out to you? We're between 15 and 20 homes that the mortgages have been sold. They're gone. They, they wow. the families own the homes. Oh, that's um, awesome. Yeah. And there was a there was a family several years ago that, you know, I don't know what number they were. It had to be early on because they, they had a 20-year mortgage that they paid off. 
And the, you, you know, they had raised their kids there. They had raised their children in this house. And I actually went to see their house and it was really, it was a beautiful house. And they were just able to tell stories about how their kids were raised, you know, around this table right here. And wow. But that's pretty significant. You know, my my two sons, my oldest and middle son, my middle son was only six months when we moved to this home, but they've all pretty much grown up in this home. And that's pretty substantial when when you think about the fact that you've given a family home. They mm-hmm. they have grown up around this table. Like that's what they're going to think of when they think of their childhood. They're not going to think of, you know, being in a cramped one bedroom basement apartment, sharing a bed with two siblings. They're going to think about right. their home and maybe the meals that they had around this table, the holidays. I mean, that's just amazing when you think about the lives that you've transformed in this program. And it's it's not only, as you said, that stability, but it's also, you know, families that come in and they purchase through us and they get a fixed mortgage, no interest. And, and right now that's pretty, that's amazing because right now these interest rates are crazy. I mean, they yeah. are so significantly that it's really priced a lot of people out of the market. Right. Well, yeah, you, I mean, even my wife and I, like, we're like, well, we ain't going to look for a house right now because <laughs> right. we're going to wait. But yeah, so it, it's a chance for them to all of a sudden go from paying, I, I don't know, like 1400 a month to 1000 a month, you know, when oh, you wow. consider property taxes and and the, the principal on the mortgage, right? So that's extra money that they now have that they're able to do something else with. Right. One of our families, they moved into the house. And it was a mother, daughter, the mother worked, she was from Ethiopia, the mother and daughter are Mm -hmm. American citizens, right? Or they're either Americans or they are permanent residents. Okay. Because that's, you know, one one thing you'll hear is like, oh, you're giving it away to illegals or immigrants. And no, they're, they're Americans. Mm -hmm. Uh, They're here for the, for the duration. But this family, so it was a mother and a daughter, they shared a one bedroom, a one room apartment basement, oh, wow. right? It was an illegal basement. Mm. And the mother would go to work at like four or five in the morning. And her daughter would study at night under the sheets because they shared a bed. Right. So her mother had to, had, the mother had to sleep. So mm. it went from a one room illegal basement to her mother owns, they have their own house. I think it's a two bedroom, maybe three, it's probably a three bedroom townhome. And she's actually now at Brown University. She's going to get her master's from public health from Brown, the daughter. Yeah, it's a pretty cool story. She would have probably gotten to Brown on her own because she's so smart and such a hard worker. But as she acknowledges, it certainly helped that in her sophomore year of high school, she all of a sudden had her own place to study and to focus and as she said, you know, she was able to invite friends over. She wasn't embarrassed. Mm-hmm. I mean, look, being a teenager, you know, I wouldn't want to be a teenager again, right? But being a teenager is hard enough. Can you imagine like, oh, I don't want my friends to come over and see my house mm-hmm. because, you know, no. See, those, um, kind of, those kind of stories give me goosebumps because those kind of examples are like what this, what Habitat is all about. I mean, you're giving people the best quality life that they could possibly get. Everybody wants a safe, beautiful, comfortable home. And, you know, at thrift diving, that's what I always promote too. You know, it's not about making your house look like the cover of HGTV magazine. Like if we have that, or if you have that skill or that ability to pull it off or you, you know, great, more power to you. But most of us just want a comfortable, beautiful, and I say beautiful, beautiful can be anything to you, but a comfortable, beautiful home where you walk in and you're like, like you can breathe a sigh of relief. You should never walk into your home and just be like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I live here in a bad yeah. way. You know, you want to walk in and be like, wow, I'm so glad that I'm home. Now, I know we're kind of running out of time here. I just have a few other questions, but I wanted yep. you to kind of talk what the talk through, like what the process is for someone to become a volunteer, because I really think, especially, you know, people who are listening to this that have drive and the desire to help and volunteer and just contribute to this mission. I want them to be able to do that. So number one, the other question that I'm going to ask you is, you know, what challenges do you face or does Habitat face coming up? Like, what are those things that, you know, make you kind of lose sleep at night? If there are any, maybe there aren't. 
And then the third one is I want you to tell me a little bit about that huge project that's going to be starting in Rockville. <laughs> so process to become a volunteer. So there's a, there's a lot of different ways to volunteer and there's a lot of different skill levels. So you can volunteer on the build site like you and you have skills or you can volunteer on the build site and you have no skills like me. We will take you where you are and use your skills or not your skills, use your drive, your your ingenuity, your willingness to help and do anything to help to help build houses. So one way you can volunteer is on the build side. That's typically what people think about when they think about habitat. But what I do see is a lot of times people will select themselves out like, well, I don't have skills or I, I don't want to be embarrassed or stuff like that. So what I would encourage anybody listening is to you don't have to have skills. I mean, the joke around the office is I can volunteer and I look, I can raise money, but I am not skilled, right? So anybody can volunteer because a lot of times what we need is we sometimes we just literally just need bodies. Oh, you know, there have been times when it's like there's a pile of stuff and we need to move it from here to there. So we need people to move stuff. <laughs> <laughs> you yeah. know, not necessarily cut and nail and screw and glue. It's we just need you to move this stuff. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we, we had the staff last year volunteer at Garland. And literally what I had to do was I had to move dirt because the dirt was on the side. That's where, you know how, uh, so Garland is the house. It's a single family house. We're splitting it in two to create duplexes. Yes. yes. That's yeah. when you come a park, right? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So that's an that's an example of missing middle housing, where we're showing how you can increase density without increasing. You don't have to like build right. another house right next to each other. So we're using an existing single family house structure, creating two duplexes. So on the right side of Garland, where the 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 driveway is going to go for mm-hmm. the for the right side, there was a big pile of dirt that I had to move. So it was me and another staff member no longer with us basically i just shoveled dirt into the wheelbarrow and mo- you know moved it over but it's yeah. it's stuff like that that we need so you can, you can volunteer at the build site you can volunteer in the office we always need help with administrative tasks the other way you can volunteer and you mentioned it earlier is at our restores so our restores i call them goodwill on steroids mm. and you, you know you know you've been there oh, and yes. you can get what do we say? Miss a day, miss a deal. You know, you can get anything from, I don't know. I mean, you could pick up a lawnmower, you could pick up a children's book, you could pick up a couch, you could pick up a Can I tell you what I found there? Can yeah, I tell tell me you? What, I'll tell yeah. you the most expensive thing that I found there. And I was okay with paying the money because I knew it was going to good calls. And this was a restore. This is the one in Rockville. So I don't usually go to that. I go to the one in Silver Spring. But I walked in one day, I looked around and I saw this really cool chair that just drew my eyes. I went up and looked at it and it said $500. I was like, wait a minute. So I had to look up. I had to try to find who made this chair. Come to find out it was like, was it a $2,500? It was like a $2,500 stone chair. It sort of looked like if you had the moon, right? A sphere. And you sort of cut it into quarters and then you kind of scooped out the middle. So it was kind of like that. And I realized there was this wire on the back of it. I thought, why is this wire? It's a plug-in heatable chair. You can use it indoor, outdoors. It was a stone. It was like a concrete chair. And when I found it online, it was like 25, I think it was 2,500 to $3,000 for this chair. And I thought, wow, I have to have this <laughs> $500. It's a lot, but that's okay. Considering that it worked perfect. Cause I had the guy plug it in and it heated up on the inside of the chair, but the outside was completely cool to the touch. Wow. You know, I've got to get this chair. And I can't remember, I'm going to leave for anybody who's interested in what this chair looks like. I will leave a link down in the show notes, but yes. I, so right now I got it in what I consider to be like our quote unquote computer room. It's really a formal living room that we don't use a, as a formal living room. The kids play computer games there, but the chair's there. So every now and then I see the kids sitting on it and they plug it in and heat it up. The only thing is they forget to unplug it, but that was the coolest thing that I'd found there. And, you know, even though it was, it was the most expensive thing that I'd ever purchased, but I knew that the money was going towards, you know, I was again, at the time, still a crew leader. And I thought, you know what, this is going to Habitat to support their mission. So I didn't mind 
pan. Plus I wrote it off as a business ex- business expense. I'm like, eh, it's going to go in my shed when I get my shed together. So <laughs> it's office furniture, right? Yeah. But that was the most, that was the most amazing thing. So I agree with you. Miss a day, miss a deal. Yeah. So like you walk in and you see that you're like, wow, $500, this is crazy. But then knowing that whenever something is donated to us, we mark it down at least 50%, right? Oh, yeah. And yeah. clearly with that chair, it was more. There was nothing wrong with that chair. Nothing yeah. at all. Yeah. And so you're, you're, you're definitely getting a deal. And then, like you said, you know that that $500 is going towards affordable housing. So all the money that, that the restores raise this year, they're going to generate about probably three hundred and fifty to $400,000 in net profit. Wow. That, that is what helps us to build houses. Is that for just here? And are you speaking just for like Maryland, Montgomery and Prince George's? Yeah. So we have two restores, one on East Goody, one on Plum Orchard Drive, right off of Cherry Hill. Yeah. That's when you go to. We're in, we don't have any in Prince George's County right now, but that's our next where we're going to open a third. Mm -hmm. But yeah, they'll net about $350,000 Three hundred fifty to four hundred thousand dollars. Wow! So it makes me feel good shopping there, knowing that my my dollars are going towards affordable. Yeah, housing. I mean, you're you are indirectly supporting the creation of affordable housing for lower income families. That that's what you're doing by shopping there, and you're getting an amazing deal. You know? Oh, can I tell you about a? Okay, so that's indirect support. I'll tell you. Just recently, um, some of my readers and I we did a thirty day money makeover challenge. It was like a six week, actually, it ended up being six weeks, not 30 day. And what we were trying to do is to just get people more focused on just being intentional about where they spend their money and cleaning up their wallets. And what's really interesting is that the $20 entrance fee that we charged people to sign up, we told them half of it, we're going to donate to Habitat for Humanity Metro. So I just made the donation. I think it's been maybe two weeks now, and it was only $170. But we made that donation. And That's awesome. Yes. And you know what was really great is when I received a letter about a week later, I received a letter personalized to me. It might have even had your name on it, Jeff. Hey, you know, it would have. Yeah. Yes. That's <laughs> and it really was personalized cool. to me. And it, and it told me, it said, you know, currently right now, these are the homes that we're working on and yeah. these are the families. And I, it just, it felt so good. I probably have the letter. Yes, I do. That's <laughs> awesome. That's me. Yes. Okay. Yes. That's you. And you personally signed it. <laughs> but and yeah, actually, I like that it. it told me exactly what we're working on. And so it made me want to do that again. So going forward, when, you know, we're doing things with thrift diving, taking a portion of that, maybe next time, you know, maybe we can't do half, but maybe even 25% or 10% of what we bring in, making sure that that's the, the community aspect of what we do here at thrift diving. So that not only are we, we shopping, restore and and helping indirectly, but actually supporting directly. And then, you know, giving our own sweat equity as well. Yeah. You know, I I know why you said it, but when you said, you know, just 190 or whatever the number was. 170. 170. Well, you don't want to say just, because that like kind of takes away from the fact. I know. I know. Because it's like, uh, I wish I could do so much more, but. No, I I know. I know. But it's, it's everybody contributing, you know, I mean, and, and that's what that, you know, so it, we have someone that donates $10 a month or five, maybe it's, I don't know, whatever it is. And we have someone that donates $25,000 a year, but we, you know, I mean, whatever you're, whatever you think about Hillary Clinton and her politics, it does take a village. It takes everybody willing to contribute what they're able to contribute to make it, make this possible. So don't, don't just say just because, or don't, you know, don't don't take away from the significance of what you did. Cause you didn't have to, you didn't have to do that. You didn't have to give to us. Well, we Uh, felt good about that. No, that's awesome. So you can also volunteer at the ReStore, right? Volunteers are really the lifeblood of our organization because volunteers are what enable us to keep our costs down in the restores. And then that that generates money for, for affordable housing. So if someone's interested, they can go to our website, habitatmm.org. And there's a button, how to volunteer, or I want to volunteer. And then you can click on that and sign up, or you can send an email to volunteer at habitatmm.org and just say, hey, I'm interested in volunteering. You know, what, what do I do? And they're going to tell you to go to the website but so that's how you can that's how you can volunteer and then you know when you talk about challenges so our the biggest impediments we have 
to building more homes and serving more families is lack of capital and lack of opportunity. So, and this ties in with Randolph Road. So you mentioned earlier the Randolph Road project. So the Mm -hmm. Randolph Road project is an example of using county-owned land, formerly owned by Montgomery County Land, and partnering with another nonprofit. So we're partnering with AHC, which provides affordable rental housing opportunities, and Montgomery County, who provided the land at a dollar, and then wow. Habitat for Humanity, yeah, Habitat for Humanity, Metro Maryland. So at the intersection of Veers Mill and Randolph Road, there's 6.2 acres. It was the former site of the, it was the headquarters for the Recreation Department okay. in Montgomery yeah. County. And so Mark Elrich, he is focused on home ownership, and he wants to use as much as possible county-owned land to further the creation of affordable housing home ownership and rental. So what he did, his administration made the land available, put out bid for RFPs. We partnered with AHC to build, and the the proposal was to build 195 units, of which 168 are, I could do my math in my head, 168 are rental, affordable rental, and 27 are home ownership units. Wow. And so we're going to build two condo built two buildings of condos, 12 units in each building and then three single family homes. Mm-hmm. And then mm-hmm. AHC is responsible for the other 168 units. So there's going to be a half acre of green space, there's going to be areas for children to play, there's going to be areas for barbecues. There's going to be a child care center in the large building. There's going to be a community room. And mm-hmm. then it, it's going to be close to a future transit-oriented uh, or rapid bus line. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's you know access to grocery stores within walking distance. Mm-hmm. So it really is a great example of what can happen when the county uses its tools, which is it has land, right. and tries to identify partners, us and AHC. And the county put in a significant significant amount of money to make this possible. So the total, I think the total project's like 69 million, I think. Mm. Habitat's portion is nine 9.9 million. So it's our largest project to date. Wow. The county gave us a $2 million commitment letter that we don't want to use, but if we have to, we would access that mm-hmm. uh, to work on the project. But that $2 million enabled us to get to closing so we could show Sandy Spring Bank, who's a great bank, and they're partnering with us, mm-hmm. that yes, we have all the money. We got a construction loan through Sandy Spring Bank. We had a $1.5 million capital campaign. We're going to be we're pursuing grants through the Federal Home Loan Bank of Atlanta and Pittsburgh to make up our $9 million part of the project. Mm-hmm. Here's the cool part. So of the 24 condo units, eight are reserved for families at 30% AMI, eight are reserved for families at 40%, and eight are reserved for families at 50% of AMI. So and, it's an opportunity. I I should have, sorry to interrupt. I know I should have asked you earlier, what is the AMI? Stand for again? Sorry. So AMI, yeah, great question. It's area median income. So in the DC metropolitan area, half of the households are above 146,000, half are below. So it's kind of the way that, and if someone knows better, I apologize because I'm not sure how accurate this is. HUD uses that to define the poverty line, et cetera, like that. So, you know, for 30% of AMI, for a family of four, I think it's somebody making around $40,000 they're going to have access to the ability to to create intergenerational wealth mm-hmm. uh, 30 40 and 50 and what we did is we we co-located the condo units with the rental units so whereas before if we just built the 24 condo units they have to bear the entire burden of the maintenance of the property which mm-hmm. then you have high condo fees and if right. you have high condo fees then you are setting yourself up for problems because the mortgage 
plus the high condo fees could oh, push yeah. them over 30%. You have the condominiums co-located with the rental unit. So you're spreading out the costs over 106, 195 properties as opposed to 24. And then we also have the three single family homes that will, you know, that are part of it. So and that's the Randolph you, Road project. Okay. And when do you project that all of those units will be done? That's- so if you drive by, actually, I just drove by it yesterday. So there, all the ground is all torn up. We So we selected, working with our partners, we selected Harkins Construction. They're doing the project. They're a great partner. They're ripping up all the ground, you know, getting everything ready to go. We anticipate the start of the construction on the homes. And so the first year is all the site development. Then next fall would be the December of 24 or the fall of 24 is when we start construction and mm-hmm. we're anticipating right now the schedule has us having families move in in the spring of 25 okay so i mean look it takes a while you know i wish it happened quicker but it is what it is but i think this this is a model of what we can do mm-hmm. when we can partner with another nonprofit housing provider and the county you know, I mean, if we didn't get the land from the county for a dollar, we, we couldn't have made this happen. There was another right. project that I was hoping to, you know, it was like, I, I mean, it was, I don't know, 18, 20 acres of land, but they wanted wow. $28 million. So I, I, you know, I can't do that. Um, well, maybe, so the fact you, that, sorry, I was going to say, do you think that Prince George's County could have something like this in the works? Do Absolutely. Amenable uh, to... So we've been meeting with the Prince George's County Council, most of whom, I, I think there's 11 members. I think they just got six or seven new members. So we, we've been meeting with them talking about, you know, our, our model, what we're trying to do. And I mean, there's definitely interest. It's finding the right sweet spot where we can bring our resources to bear and the county is able to contribute. So mm-hmm. I mean, they, so they may have something going on that, you know, we're not part of, but we, yeah, I think there's interest. I mean, I look, I think everybody recognizes the need for, for affordable housing. The question is, you know, how are you going to do it and how do you pay for it? Mm -hmm. Uh, We, because we're Habitat, we, our brand name gets us in the door and gets us recognition. And, you know, we certainly have experience, but that's sort of our value, right? Oh, definitely. We can, oh, we're with Habitat. Oh, all right. Well, I know about Habitat and, but we really need, we need the government to provide land opportunities, which, you know, Montgomery County is happening. And we've been talking to some people in Prince George's County and then having capital. The founder of Quinonia Farm, he has a great line. Clarence Jordan, he said, what the poor need is not charity, but capital, not Mm -hmm. caseworkers, but co-workers. And what the rich need is a wise way to divest themselves of their overabundance. Mm, I love that. So, you know, that, that is really what we're all about. And, you know, we'd love to, hey, we'd love to partner with anybody. There are a number of times when someone will call up and say, I have land. Most of the time, that is not land we can build on, uh, mm-hmm. but they have the right intent, you know. Yeah, so, um, and you never you never know what may pan out when someone calls and said they have they have something. <laughs> Anything? No, have- listen, listen. You you yeah, you have no idea. And I, so on one hand, you're like, oh man, I gotta go follow this lead. But you know, Maple Hill up in Gaithersburg. You know, that was land that we bought. It was like three acres of land. And it was just like, hey, let's go look at this piece of land and see what happens. So you, you have to kind of follow everything because you just don't, like you said, you don't know what's going to happen. And it may be, look, it may be that that doesn't happen, but something else pops because right. you met with somebody. And, you know, right now we're working on trying to identify faith communities that may have land that they, and and because of the social justice nature of the faith tradition, they are looking at how they can use land, use their resource to help affordable housing mm-hmm. and generate some revenue for the, for the church. Mm-hmm. So, wow, I didn't realize it was already 12. I years. know, this has been great. I know, I was like, oh, I don't want to keep you. Jeff, thank you so much. This has been a really good conversation. How can people or where should people go? If you just want to repeat that, if they want to volunteer, if they want to learn more about Habitat, where should they go? Yeah. So the best thing to do is go to our website at habitatmm.org. 
And there's, you know, information, ways to get involved. If you want, you know, you're checking out this blog or this podcast or the blog and you're like, hey, I, I might be interested in a house or I know someone that might be interested in a house. Have them go to our website. They can sign up for on the inquiry, li- inquiry list and learn more. They can go there to volunteer. They can go there to make a donation or they can send an email to info at habitatmm.org. And that will get sent to the right people. And uh, that's how they can get involved. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time. Well, I don't know about you, but I feel like I know a lot more about Habitat for Humanity. And I know that this was specific to the metro area, the D.C., Washington, Maryland, VA area. But I think the same can be true of your Habitat for Humanity. I would advise you to maybe reach out to them and find out how you can volunteer, how you can be a part of all the good that they're doing in your community. Shop at the ReStore, donate your money directly or help indirectly or volunteer your time. It's a great organization. This isn't sponsored. They didn't ask me to put this podcast together. This is just me really wanting to bring to you and highlight the good that this nonprofit is doing in this community. And here's a really cool idea. I don't think we mentioned this during the interview, but Habitat can actually have groups come out to volunteer as an organization. And I'm thinking that we might be able to get a group of people who are living locally that want to come out to the job site and build together. Sometimes you'll have maybe like a local baseball team from a university or maybe like a real estate group, they'll have maybe five, six people come out, maybe even more and participate, participate that day. So that might be something really cool that we can, you know, put together for thrift diving. I'll be your crew leader for the day. (laughs) And I'll teach you how to use tools. And we'll see whatever the construction managers have that's available for us to do that day. But just a heads up that that is something that could be coming down the pike. And because our missions are so aligned There could be other opportunities that you might see coming down the pike between thrift diving and Habitat for Humanity. So just putting it out there. I don't know what they are yet, but I think (laughs) it's kismet. Is that the word? Yeah, kismet for us to like work together. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this interview. Come back next week. We're going to be doing more interviews and just talking about projects. I have a great update for you, but I'm not going to share it yet because I want to save all the goodness about those metal cabinets, you know, the vintage metal cabinets I'm painting. I want to have all of that for you in a video, maybe this weekend. (laughs) So be sure to stick around on the YouTube channel. You can find me at Thrift Diving. Go on Instagram at Thrift Diving. And also, I want to tell you, if you're not signed up for my email list, you can go to thriftdiving.com forward slash subscribe. You can get five ebooks printables for free just by signing up. And whenever there's something new, guess what? You're going to be the first one to hear via email. So you want to sign up so you don't miss anything. All right. Have a great week or weekend whenever you're listening to this. And I will see you next episode. Diving. Find it ugly, make it pretty. Mm-hmm. Paint a power tools, alright. Saving money with those crystal vibes.